all right let's get started with this one a two day uh, a patient is coming with two day history of fever chills and a lot of fatigue his blood pressure is 80 over 60 pulse 130 respiratory rate 20 there is left flank tenderness uh, leukocyte counts are 19,000 there is neutrophilia BUN 24 creatine 1.7 nitrites positive in urine analysis and urine is showing a lot of WBC count okay now we'll have to compare all these parameters which I have written and you have to tell me what will be like it will increase or decrease as far as interleukin 1 6 all those things are concerned okay now let's start what do you think will be the levels of interleukin 1 in this patients a high or low high high okay first of all what's your diagnosis in this patient Diagnosis? Pneumonia. Why? There is left flank tenderness, there is leukocytosis, and there is hypotension. What do you call this? ILD. What? Intestinal lung disease. Sepsis. This is sepsis. Yes, this is septic shock. Why do you think uh, it is interstitial lung disease? Why will you have leukocytosis, left flank tenderness, say like hypotension? This is septic shock. Left flank tenderness, that means this is septic shock because of what? Kidney. Kidney. Where's the like primary infection is in kidney. So this is pyelonephritis. Okay. Uh, this is pyelonephritis that's the, the kidney the inflammation of the kidney the kidneys has like lot of pus in it or like there is already like lot of infection in the kidney so pyelonephritis has caused uh, septic shock in this patient it's very common in elderly patient to develop UTI see because elderly patient like gets UTI and out of like if the UTI ends up they get pyelonephritis and they, they get septic shock okay so Anushka said interleukins level will be high because they are high in septic shock what about interleukin 6 uh, levels in this patient? Hi. TNF alpha. Hi. Okay. CRP. Increased, please. Okay. Endotoxins. Increased. Because they have a lot of bacteria, especially gram negative bacteria. What's the most common organism which can cause septic shock? Staphylococcus. That's gram positive. That's E. coli. Staphylococcus is gram positive. Most common organism which can cause like pyelonephritis and UTI. That's E. coli, which is gram negative. And gram negative bacteria has endotoxin in it. Okay. Endotoxin, exotoxin is for gram positives. Endotoxin are component of the cell wall. So if they break down, they'll release endotoxin. And that endotoxin will upregulate interleukin 1, 6, TNF alpha, and all those things. Okay. So endotoxins will be high because it's gram negative. What about neutrophils? Increase. Increase because it's again sepsis. Okay, now endotoxins is going to damage your endothelial cells, and it is your endothelial cells are damaged, and of course your endotoxins and all those things will also upregulate uh, acute phase reactants. If they ask about acute phase reactants, will they be increased or decreased? In septic shock. Increase. 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 Perfect. They'll be increased. Now, uh, actually, usually in any kind of shock, like for example, hemorrhagic shock, if you are having hemorrhagic shock, what will be the levels of vasopressin? Levels of vasopressin or antitiretic hormone in hemorrhagic shock? High. High. Okay. It is increased because we want to retain uh, fluids when you are getting hemorrhagic shock. But what do you think will be the levels of vasopressin in septic shock? It decreases. It is decreasing. Okay. So levels of vasopressin and antidiuretic hormone are decreased in septic shock because of dysregulation. And that's why your ADH is not like able to act enough on your blood vessels. That's why your blood vessels will dilate. 
that's why you have septic shock okay so vasopressin levels um, it's because because of the dysfunction in the secretion of adh uh, and that's actually the main reason why these patients have septic shock and hypotension in septic shock so the levels of vasopressins are less in septic shock but in as like in other shock they are high and since nitric oxide and prostaglandins are acute phase reactants what do you think their levels will be in septic shock high or low high so nitric oxide prostaglandins will be high so adh will be low in this patient of septic shock okay so vasopressin is uh, low in this patient because of dysfunctional host response to infectious pathogen and because of that you'll have all the vasodilators which are high nitric oxide will be high prostaglandin will be high adh will be low because it sees vasopressin vasopressin is going to do vasoconstriction with the help of v1 receptor if that's dysfunctional you'll have vasodilation and you'll have a lot of hypotension okay so septic shock is a kind of distributive shock where you have a lot of vasodilation uh, so your what will happen to your total peripheral resistance in septic shock decreases total peripheral resistance will be decreased perfect so that's about your septic shock okay patient is coming to you with acute shortness of breath um, he has history of cystic fibrosis and recurrent pneumonia he is having frequent productive cough bp is 80 over 60 pulse 120 respiratory rate 25 physical examination is showing cyanosis and subcutaneous crepitus what's your diagnosis and breath sounds are decreased on the left okay no 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 pneumothorax pneumothorax mm, this is pneumothorax okay now you guys also said pneumonia and plural effusion and answer is pneumothorax the reason why this is not plural effusion can you tell me why this is not plural effusion breath sounds are decreased in plural effusion and in pneumonia both but why this is not plural effusion we cannot ignore subcutaneous crepitus right there is a lot of cyanosis and why is this patient having bp of like 80 over 60 if it is pneumothorax compression pulmonary vasoconstriction lung compression okay so is it a simple pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax it's a acute shortness of breath so is it simple pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax let's say you have a lot of air filled in this plural cavity a lot of air there is mediastinal shift this everything is shifting on this side um, so you'll also compress your vessels and because you compress your vessels you'll have hypotension let's say you compress your ivc svc less blood is coming into your heart and you have hypotension so because of all those compression of the vessels you are having less preload that's why you're having hypotension is it simple pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax in the simple pneumothorax, uh, the patient might be asymptomatic or slightly symptomatic. Yes. But here is the acute shortness of breath. Yes. So tension pneumothorax. Very good. So, and at the top, this patient is hemodynamically unstable. You have to always think about tension pneumothorax when the patient is like severely hemodynamically unstable. And you'll also have mediastinal shift. Okay. And if I say about intrapleural pressure, Intrapleural pressure will become more negative in tension pneumothorax or positive? positive? Positive. Very good. That's positive intrapleural pressure. And that was your answer. Okay, so there'll be loss of negative intrapleural pressure. So that means the intrapleural pressure will be become positive. Okay. 
in any so pay attention to these two important these are golden vitals if somebody is has is has high like hypotension and tachycardia that means we are worried about something and this is very important sign especially in hemorrhagic shock hypotension with tachycardia is very important sign in hemorrhagic shock okay so this is tension pneumothorax probably this is patient is already having cystic fibrosis and like lot of lung damage so is it like a primary pneumothorax or secondary pneumothorax secondary secondary very good because secondary that means already there is some predisposition of the lung like cystic fibrosis this is secondary spontaneous pneumothorax next step in management you guys must be expert now needle decompression very good needle decompression followed by chest tube placement okay so these are all pneumothorax this is collapse of lung collapse of lung this is again pneumothorax okay this is a completely blackout and here there is a lot of like air here it's compressing on the other side that's why this is tension pneumothorax okay elderly man coming with two weeks of shortness of breath he's having dyspnea while lying down so that he sleeps on chair on examination there is jugular venous distension there is decreased breath sound and dullness to percussion on bilateral lung basis okay there is pitting edema in bilateral lower limb chest x-ray is showing cardiomegaly and there is bilateral pleural effusion on both sides and on auscultation there is always like uh, crepitus on bilateral lung basis serum protein is 6 serum ldh is 60 they are asking which of the following will be the set of plural fluid finding if you aspirate and send it for cytology what would you choose out of five options d a hmm okay a is i'll not tell whether it's correct or not first of all tell me a is transudate or exudate transudate transudate me what is it transudate or exudate transudate okay i thought you said exudate right you said exudate no, no, first no, no, okay no 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 transudate transudate this is transudate uh what is b b is exudate why exudate why nine limit very good so ldh either should be more than 200 or it should be more than two by three of the upper limit so if it's around 90 or above 90 we call that exudate okay so very good if you guys are having any trouble in decoding this one please stop me and ask me okay so this is exudate what about c exudate again exudate what about d exudate exudate uh, both because of this and this if your protein is how much more how much it should be so we call it uh exudate only protein of the plural fluid more than one third more than two more than 2.5 grams per deciliter if it's protein more than 2.5 grams per deciliter it's exudate or if your plural fluid protein by serum fluid protein ratio is more than 0.5 0.5 okay so if you do either way okay so plural is here it is four and serum here it is six so this ratio is clearly how much i hope it is more than 0.5 it is more than 0.5 right yeah 0 0.5 something no 0 0.6 something so this is clearly more than 0 0.5 and uh, how about e it is still exuded exuded because of high protein okay so the only option so by the way what's your diagnosis in this patient Cardiogenic pulmonary failure. 
heart failure. heart failure so yeah is having heart failure and bilateral pleural effusion for that so that should be exudative or transudative 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 so correct option is a a ideally you shouldn't have done pleural tapping in this patient because you know that's because of heart failure they have just given you for like you know for your information but if you know that that's plural effusion is because of heart failure ideally you shouldn't do plural tapping your first step is always you give diuretics to the patient and if like is like furthermore furthermore you don't know why it is happening then you might do plural tap okay so we already came to an answer and these are lights criteria and you already know this Okay, patient is having hypotension, shortness of breath shortly after placing right-sided subclavian central venous catheter. His BP is now 80 over 50, pulse is 1110. Uh, there is jugular venous distension, breath sounds are decreased on the right. Oh, sorry, breath sounds are decreased on the right and trachea is deviated on the left. What's your diagnosis? Pneumothorax. This is... Uh, simple pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax. Diagnosis is tension pneumothorax. Very good. And uh, why is this patient having hypotension? Same explanation as previous. The air yeah, because the lung and a blood vessel. Perfect. Open. You are just compressing the blood vessels or less preload. Okay. Because of less venous return. Perfect. So we have two complications while inserting central line. One, you can injure the pleura and get pneumothorax. Second, you can injure the common carotid artery. Young man is having nausea, vomiting and severe abdominal pain. He already had acute pancreatitis a year ago. Yesterday, he had like 750 ml of binge drinking because of partying. Uh, now he's having tenderness in the epigastric region. Serum lipase is high. On second day of hospitalization, he's now having shortness of breath and hypoxia, chest x-ray showing white out lungs. What's your diagnosis? ARDS. Wow. You guys are ARDS expert now. Uh, which parameter will be normal? Pulmonary tapping. PCWP. Very good. That's ARDS. Patient comes to you with urgent on urgent and clinic because of shortness of breath. He is on ski vacation um, at Colorado at height. I like they mentioned about height uh, here uh, in some of the NBME questions. You have to like they they they'll mention some very high altitude places. Uh, if you know if they mention about Shimla, we come to know. But if they mention about something like in United States, it's difficult. Was difficult for me at least. So just like there are like two th two three places which are at very like you know high altitude so know them so colorado they have given already at high altitude so this question is of high altitude he is having worsening worsening dyspnea and cough shortness of breath with minimal exertion his saturation is 86 on ambient air which rapidly improves to 95 percent with supplementation supplemental oxygen at high altitude if you give supplemental oxygen why do you think the saturation rapidly improves partial pressure of the oxygen increases you okay definitely but what important path like thing is happening in your lungs during hypoxia what's happening pulmonary hypoxic vasoconstriction right PIO2 during hypoxia decrease. your cpio2 is already decreased your p capital o2 is decreased at altitude your pao2 is decreased at your altitude and at the top you have pulmonary hypoxic vasoconstriction because of hypoxia so you give supplemental oxygen your vessels will keep on like dilating so that's how you you increase your uh, pao2 as well as sao2 and of course you are of course increasing everything in pio2 as well but anyways now this patient is having bilateral inspiratory crackles and chest x-ray is showing patchy alveolar infiltrates this is a challenging question but i would be really impressed if somebody can explain me the pathophysiology that why is this patient i'll tell you the diagnosis this patient was at altitude he is now getting patchy pulmonary infiltrates why do you think this patient had uh, patchy pulmonary infiltrates Okay, these patchy pulmonary infiltrates are actually pulmonary edema. 
but why this patient developed patchy pulmonary edema ha huh? this is high altitude pulmonary edema right? okay perfect this is high altitude pulmonary edema why do you think it becomes like the distribution is patchy at high altitude like the smaller airways undergo which vasoconstriction hypoxia induced because of hypoxia induced vasoconstriction at some place and because of dilation at some place okay so it's actually vq mismatch actually uh this let's say this place is having a lot of hypoxia and there is lot of vasoconstriction and if there is vasoconstriction here there will be definitely some place which will receive more blood than it should receive more than usual so this place which where it is receiving lot of blood their hydrostatic pressure in the capillary will become will become so high that a time will come it will just disrupt the capillary alveolar membrane and when this is ruptured you get edema at that place so wherever you have lot of high hydrostatic pressure in the capillary you get edema and some place there is lot of vasoconstriction so it is like lot of vq mismatch which is causing patchy alveolar infiltrates is it okay everyone uh the other other pathology which you'll learn in step 2 where you also see patchy alveolar infiltrates uh, after road traffic accident if you just hit your chest wall and after let's say 24 hr you uh, initially let's say the patient is having normal chest x ray and after 24 hours if you repeat the chest x ray that chest x ray is showing irregular patchy opacity your diagnosis is lung contusion okay so that is your lung contusion initially it's a chest x ray will be normal after 24 hours you may see irregular patchy opacity that's your step 2 question okay so this is high altitude pulmonary edema because of uh, vq mismatch somewhere you have lot of high hydrostatic pressure because of that you might rupture alveolar capillary membrane at that place okay patient is having ards he is intubated and mechanically ventilated with positive pressure ventilation despite of use of high peep that's positive end uh, expiratory pressure he continues to deteriorate now we are putting the patient on prone uh, he is having little improvement in oxygen saturation why what happens when you like change the position to prone there is more space for the alveoli to open up okay actually i really like the explanation of you like you world in this uh, question uh they said like mostly the lung tissues are on the post see, no doubt you have lung tissue but anteriorly on the anterior side it's like lot of heart and all those other things which are heart and like major vessels are occupying the uh, mediastinum on the anterior surface uh, mostly majority of the lung tissues are on the posterior side so if the patient is sleeping on the posterior side uh your heart and chest wall everything will push the lungs okay so that's why there'll be little compression of the lungs here if you place the patient prone your heart and all the vessels will rest on your anterior chest wall if you are on the prone side so your posterior lung side will be free so they'll open up so when you put air so they'll have good oxygenation when you put the patient on the prone position so that's prone position ventilation preferred uh, for patient who are having ards so when you put the patient put on there will be improved vq uh, ratio okay patient after motor vehicle accident uh, he is already having a history of celiac disease and three episodes of pneumonia after motor vehicle accident his uh, blood pressure was 80 over 45 pulse 130 there was lot of pallor fast scan showed splenic laceration fast scan is just you do abdominal ultrasound focused abdominal sonography uh, for trauma that showed splenic laceration he received o negative packed red blood cell volume during transfusion he developed facial swelling generalized hives and shortness of breath why he got transfused with uh, iga he has celiac disease right mm hmm he has celiac disease he has like pneumonia so probably he is having what 
cystic fibrosis. Oh, IgA deficiency. This is selective IgA deficiency. Selective IgA deficiency because IgA gives mucosal immunity. You can have recurrent pneumonia. You can have recurrent mucosal infection. And sometimes celiac disease is uh, common in patient with selective IgA deficiency. Here in step two, they'll ask you, see, what, what antibodies do you check in celiac disease? IgA. Mm. Anti-tissue transglutaminase and anti-endomycel antibodies. These, these are IgA in nature and so sometimes this can be negative in patients of celiac disease who are having selective IgA deficiency. So antibody levels can be normal in patients with celiac disease who are having selective IgA deficiency. That's why the definitive diagnosis requires duodenal biopsy where you see uh, villi atrophy and intraepithelial lymphocytes and plasma cells. So they also check I sometimes they have IgG against these antibodies. What? Sometimes like whenever you have IgA deficiency, like selective IgA deficiency, don't they check IgG against these antibodies? Mm. Like I, I didn't understand. Like why why would you check IgG? Like I know they check total uh, immunoglobulins level to know whether uh, there is total IgA deficiency. But uh, but like what are you trying to say? IgG against what? Against these at like anti-transglutaminase and. Oh yeah 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 yes. Yeah. So. So they, they can be IgA nature and this can be IgG nature as well. But if they yeah, are IgA. Yeah. Yeah, so if they are IgA in nature, they'll be very low. But you can check IgG as well. Yes, if they are IgG anti transglutaminase and all those things. Definitely, yes. But this patient was having selective IgA deficiency, and after you gave blood transfusion, this patient had allergic reaction to that blood. That blood probably had IgA. And this patient of selective IgA deficiency makes antibodies against IgA. And these are IgE in nature. Okay, so they sometimes make IgE antibodies against the exogenous IgA which you are giving in the blood. Because the blood group is O negative, this will have O both antibodies against A and B, right? Correct or no? Yes, yes. Blood is O negative. That's why they'll have both anti A and anti B. So this anti uh like uh what i was saying this anti iga antibodies uh and these patients sometimes develop ige against these antibodies are you like understanding what i'm trying to say see normally is it like this correct right if you form iga ige antibodies against this anti nda antibodies you'll have allergic reaction so because these patients are not having IgA themselves if you are not having anything which you are training your so you cannot train your immune system with that particular thing so if that's deficient you'll form antibodies against that particular thing so you'll form anti IgE against Ig like IgA antibodies or anti-IgA antibodies so that's why you have allergic reaction after transfusion so if somebody is having selective IgA deficiency there are no doubt IgA are less but IgG and IgM levels will be normal and since they don't have IgA they will form antibodies against like whatever exogenous IgA they may receive in future. If patient is having O negative blood group, what antibodies will they have in their blood? A and B. They are anti antigen A and anti antigen antigen B. Okay, so if you just confuse from what I said for the last from the last slide, I meant anti 
A and anti B, not anti IgA. Did I confuse you guys? Okay, there's a lot of silence. If you are C, don't confuse antigen A and antigen B with the antibodies anti A and anti B. Okay, we are that blood grouping system is A B O blood grouping system. If you are having A blood group, so you'll have A antigen and have anti B, but that's that anti B against that antigen anti B. Okay, if you are having B blood group, you'll have B antigen and you'll also have anti A antibodies. Okay, if you are having A B blood group, you'll have A and B antigen, but you'll have no antibodies against that antigen A B A and B. If you are having O blood group, you'll have no antigen, but anti A and anti B antibodies against that antigen. What I'm trying to say is, if somebody is getting O negative blood transfusion, they will have some I G A. They will have some I G A. okay and the patient you are giving that blood to might have anti iga antibodies which are ige in nature so they will attack this and you'll have allergic reaction is everybody clear with this one sir can person with any blood group have iga right persons IgA with IgA yes IgA. yes 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 everybody will have iga antibodies unless you are having selective iga deficiency or hypogamma globulinemia right so you give this patient uh, any blood which has iga antibodies they will have allergic reaction that's why in patients who are having selective iga deficiency you have to give blood group which is washed okay this is step 2 question that's why you give washed uh, blood which does not have iga is it okay everyone yes, sir. all right so actually you form ige antibodies against oops the that's why you have allergic reaction to this patient uh allergic reaction to transfusions okay elderly female is having fever cough confusion flu like symptoms since last week uh, but now she is feeling worse since 3 days she is having history of copd and ckd blood pressure 70 over 40 pulse high respiratory rate high saturation 94 on 2 liters per minute oxygen on examination she is lethargic dry mucous membrane flat neck veins dullness to percussion and crackles at the right lung base chest x ray shows right sided lower lobe consolidation iv access is established first of all tell me what's your diagnosis depsy sepsis abscess ha huh? lung abscess percussion and crackles you can have uh, lung abscess followed by see ultimately it's like get giving you sepsis right mm -hmm. so you patient might have pneumonia or lung abscess but ultimately they she is getting hypotension hypoxemia lethargy so this is sepsis because of pneumonia or lung abscess so what fluids would you give in patient with sepsis aril you can give aril and normal normal saline okay so normal saline or aril are the fluid of choice in sepsis would prefer normal saline first in any sepsis okay all right this is important okay now everybody must be knowing what i am trying to ask but uh, this is what 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 is this called as sorry 
No, 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 no. Okay, let me ask you. This is train of force stimulation of any uh, skeletal muscles, and you are looking at the nerve conduction uh, with the train of force stimulation with the by if you are just stimulating that now for the four times and you are looking at the activity of muscles after giving some muscle relaxant so let's say this is a, this is your question okay uh, let's say elderly man who is having this 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 he is intubated and with given given muscle relaxant an appropriate sedative so if you want to intubate any patient you might give muscle relaxant and sedatives to that patient an anesthetist is doing this this experiment this is called a strain of force stimulation tof tof train of force stimulation if you do if you just stimulate the nerve and look at the muscle activity and you have to this is the normal muscle activity and muscle twitch you stimulate the nerve muscle will contract stimulate the nerve muscle will contract stimulate the nerve muscle will contract but if you are giving some muscle relaxant that muscle relaxant has two phases of blockade phase one and phase two the muscle relaxant which we'll talk about phase one and phase two in phase one blockade all the activity will be less that means there'll be less muscle twitch every time you stimulate the nerve but in the phase two block the stimulation the, the activity of muscle will furthermore fade down this if this is called this phenomena is called fading that initially you have no doubt there is half the response of the normal response but as the as you stimulate further there is something called as fading now they are asking which is the category of this muscle relaxant depolarizing or non depolarizing train of force stimulation i think we left this topic uh, while we were talking i think cvs right okay why there is a lot of silence okay let me explain you the train of force stimulation we have two kinds of muscle relaxant one is depolarizing and one is non depolarizing the non depolarizing muscle relaxant will give you a graph just like this okay this one the depolarizing muscle relaxant will give you graph in two phases one will be one where there will be like 50% of the response and in the phase two you'll get no doubt initial 50% response but gradually there will be fading now why is this thing happening when you give non depolarizing muscle block it is going to block both post synaptic nicotinic receptors as well as uh presynaptic nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors so if you block postsynaptic nicotinic acetylcholine receptor no doubt there will be no depolarizing activity on the postsynaptic terminals but the presynaptic nicotinic receptors are also important for positive feedback loop listen to this carefully because even you world will not explain this in non depolarizing blocks normally in normal if you want to know normal neuromuscular transmission what is happening you release acetylcholine when you release acetylcholine acetylcholine will bind to the post synaptic nicotinic receptor and when acetylcholine binds to the post synaptic uh, nicotinic receptor the sodium will come inside and you will have depolarizing depolarization now this acetylcholine will also bind at the pre synaptic terminals here and when acetylcholine binds here at the presynaptic terminals it will release furthermore acetylcholine this is called as positive feedback so everybody knows that we have postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors but we also have presynaptic acetylcholine receptors which are important for positive feedback loop so if you block presynaptic acetylcholine receptors do you think more acetylcholine will be released or less acetylcholine will be released less less if you block presynaptic nicotinic receptors acetylcholine receptors there will be less acetylcholine released and furthermore less 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 acetylcholine released 
so the thing is if you give non depolarizing blockade like for example t tubocurier or vacuronium rocuronium they are no doubt blocking the postsynaptic nicotinic receptor but they are also blocking the presynaptic nicotinic receptor since you are blocking presynaptic nicotinic receptors as well there'll be less 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 acetylcholine released subsequently because there is no positive feedback loop so if initial response is this much gradually it will decrease in response because you have blocked both presynaptic and postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors are we clear everyone that's why you will get a uh, fading of response with non depolarizing blockade the muscle relaxant is it okay everyone yes. or not okay if you give depolarizing blockade initially the depolarizing blockade or success alkaline will only desensitize the postsynaptic terminals like depolarizing will first of all desensitize the postsynaptic terminals okay so you'll have like less response but since your presynaptic terminals are okay acetylcholine can still bind to the presynaptic terminals and keep on releasing more acetylcholine if needed but no doubt you are releasing more acetylcholine but less acetylcholine will be able to act here because you are already under the effect of depolarizing muscle blockade so in phase 1 of depolarizing muscle block you are only blocking the post synaptic acetylcholine receptor your presynaptic is okay since your presynaptic okay you can mobilize further more acetylcholine but since your postsynaptic receptor is blocked it's like desensitized so the response will be obviously half because you are blocking your postsynaptic only but at phase 2 it also blocks presynaptic so when it blocks presynaptic and postsynaptic both it will just act like non depolarizing muscle blockade so this is just about blocking presynaptic and postsynaptic if you block both presynaptic and postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor at the same time like non depolarizing block you are further more not releasing acetylcholine so you'll have fading of the response whenever you stimulate your nerve gradually there'll be less 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 muscle contraction but in depolarizing block you are just first of all blocking the postsynaptic uh, receptors so when you block the postsynaptic receptor you'll have every time see initially when i was contracting the like stimulating the nerve this much was the muscle contraction but when you give succinyl choline in phase 1 initially it should be this much but it's only happening this much phase 1 block train of force stimulation 1 2 3 4 so initially it was this much now it is 50% 1 2 3 4 in phase 2 it will be like this 1 2 3 4 are you guys all clear or no ha <sighs> so in the non depolarizing block mhm mm in the phase 1 there there will be fading non depolarizing has only one phase no phase 1 phase 2 they just directly block presynaptic and postsynaptic and only and that is why in uh, depolarizing you can't reverse in phase 1 right that's the reason why you can't reverse the block in phase 1 but you can do in phase 2 yes you cannot reverse a uh, depolarizing muscle block in phase 1 very good one, right. yes ah uh, is it clear to everyone okay i assume that yes sir okay all right so let's go to the next question this is what all i have explained it took me a while every time i read i forget okay so just sink in this graph nicely for what i have explained so i think you will be understanding that let's go to ild young women 4 months of progressive dyspnea with exertion non productive cough fatigue uh ct guided lung biopsy is shown here what's your diagnosis sarcoidosis 
Oh my goodness. What is this biopsy showing? Non caseating granuloma. Non granuloma. Perfect. So these are non caseating caseating granuloma in sarcoidosis. Elderly man is having five months of progressive exertional dyspnea, occasional cough. Patient dies of respiratory failure after just after three years of initial clinic visit. Elderly man came with a dyspnea. He didn't do anything. Died after three years. Autopsy is showing heterogeneous lung parenchyma with subplural areas of dense collagen deposition. Oh no! Did you guys see? There is a lot of collagen in the subplural uh, areas. There is a lot of lymphocytes, and there is a lot of fibroblast proliferation. What's your diagnosis? Collagen, 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 collagen everywhere, and he died just in three years. This is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's very, very progressive disease. Okay, um, if you just die in three years. A lot of fibrosis. That's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because you have a lot of collagen. Okay. Patient coming uh, with shortness of breath for last six months. Now having non-productive cough on examination. There are fine crackles bilaterally. Clubbing of the fingers, drumstick appearing of the finger, chest x-ray showing diffuse reticular opacity. Pulmonary function test is showing decreased FVC. FVC, increased FEV1 by FVC ratio and expiratory, expiratory flow rates are also high. What's your diagnosis? Less FVC, but if FV, FEV1 by FVC ratio is high and expiratory flow rates are also high. What's your diagnosis? It's a restrictive lung disease. This is restrictive lung disease, uh, maybe fibrosis. And why they have super normal expiratory flow rates? Lots of elastic tissue. Lots of elastic tissue. Perfect. And that that is what? Radial traction. Okay. Traction. And because of lot of elastic tissue, the airways will remain open. That's why they, they can just exhale in like very much in one second. So because of lot of elastic tissue and because of lot of radial traction, you have super normal expiratory flow rates. Young women with shortness of breath, anterior uveit, swelling of the parotid glands, lungs are clear to auscultation, chest x-ray showing hyalur lymphadenopathy diagnosis. Sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis. If you do the biopsy, what will you see? Non-caseating -caseating granuloma. Non granuloma with giant cells. A 48-year-old man is having progressive dyspnea cough uh, for several weeks. He's a formal smoker. Saturation at rest is 88%. On examination, there is scattered crackles, uh, bilateral mid alveolar and lower alveolar opacity. The lung biopsy is this is going to be a little difficult. Lung biopsy shows um, lipoproteinaceous pass positive material. Electron microscopy shows lot of lamellar bodies. What's your diagnosis? Sarcoidosis. No. Lamellar bodies. Lamellar bodies are containing what? Isn't it asteroid bodies? This is uh, ex uh, impaired function of type 2 pneumocytes. Oh, okay. Yeah. This type is no. Uh, actually, this is what what's your diagnosis if is if anybody knows if when you have lot of uh pass positive material lipoproteinaceous material surfactant 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 everywhere if this is impaired function of type yeah, 2 pneumocytes no 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 uh in ARDS you can have highline membrane disease in ARDS but the patient uh, patient will be just like fingers like you know in hospital um i mean much more severe presentation than this this guy is like gentleman is coming to you uh so definitely not ards we have various criterias which we talked about about diagnosis diagnosing ards 
what I was saying is this is not impaired type two function pneumocyte because macrophage this, function. Hmm. If it, it it would have been impaired type two pneumocyte function, this this patient would not have a lot of lamellar bodies only. Yeah. So this this is the diagnosis of something called as alveolar proteinosis where you have impaired function of macrophages so nothing is able to clear so you keep on producing n number of things it will just line your lungs like this okay so if at all you just put a lot of fluid in your lung and just wash your fluid uh, and you just take out all the fluids you'll you'll have like a lot of surfactant coming out because you cannot clear that surfactant because of macrophage dysfunction okay so this table is very very important and i really like this table if you have macrophage dysfunction you won't be able to clear alveolar dapris include including surfactant pathogens and whatever you inhale so if there is macrophage dysfunction you get something called as alveolar proteinosis where you have this is a kind of restrictive lung disease where you, everything keeps on accumulating in your alveoli and that will be usually pass positive okay uh, if there is type 1 pneumocyte dysfunction that's usually in ARDS if you have type there if you have type 1 pneumocyte dysfunction you get ARDS type 2 pneumocyte dysfunction it's usually in respiratory distress syndrome in the baby uh, ciliary dysfunction is seen in cystic fibrosis and cartagena syndrome club cell dysfunction club cell is like are important to remove all the toxins like for example if you're a smoker or tobacco like if you are smoking your club cells are important to remove the toxins but if they are if you keep on irritating uh, it will damage your club cells in in smoking as well uh, goblet cells uh, secretes mucus you may damage that in copd and asthma or you might also see hyperplasia and metaplasia because of, of the goblet cell and you have a lot of fibroblast in interstitial lung disease and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis so this is alveolar proteinosis uh, example of restrictive lung disease where your like, alveolar macrophages are dysfunctional and you have a lot of uh, debris and everything just accumulating in your alveoli. Okay. This type of restrictive lung disease. A young woman with joint pain, uh, everywhere dry cough, shortness of breath, lungs are clear on auscultation. There is swelling and tenderness of the elbows, knees and ankle. There are scattered erythematous nodules. There is hilar fullness. Biopsy is showing giant cells, epithelioid cells and all those things. Diagnosis? Arthidosis. Treatment? Steroids. 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 Perfect. Spot diagnosis. Gross examination. This is uh, asbestosis, mesothelioma. Mesothelioma, excellent. So you see thickness of the pleura here. This is mesothelioma. Uh, more specific exposure would be of asbestosis. Uh, you also can see pleural plaques in mesothelioma, uh, asbestos exposure. And this will be positive. Mesothelioma is positive for one specific stain. That is what cytokeratin. Cytokeratin and calretinin. Huh? Calretinin. Okay. All, all, calretinin. Those, all those stains are positive for cytokeratin and calretinin. They in, have samoma bodies also. Yes, they will have samoma bodies as well. Mesothelioma. Very good. And tenofilament. Yes. Excellent. Uh, black women, young black women, elderly, or uh, young black women, exertional dyspnea, dry cough. She works as a zookeeper, bird zookeeper. Chest x ray showing bilateral lymphadenopathy. Serum ACE inhibit, serum ACE levels are high, calcium levels are high, PPD is negative. If you do bronchoalveolar lavage, which predominant cell types will you see? Eosinophil lymphocytes cd4 positive macrophages macrophages so you confused with the bird zookeeper thing huh cd4 positive this is 
It is sarcoidosis and in sarcoidosis you see predominantly CD4 positive lymphocytes. That's why CD4 by CD8 ratio is more than 2 is to 1 in bronchoalveolar lavage in sarcoidosis. Correct? Because that's a type type 4 hypersensitivity, non-caseating granuloma. But it, it, it can induce uh, interleukin 2 and TNF alpha. Definitely. So See, you'll have a lot of macrophages as well. You are correct in a way, SSV, because it's like macrophage ultimately giving non-caseating yeah. granuloma, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. that's your correct answer. Macrophage can be also high. CD4 positives it can be also high. Giant cells are also high. All those things con consisting of non-caseating granuloma are high. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Let's end this.